Can I just say this this morning, that faith isn't just important to prayer, it's essential. It's essential to prayer. And so by way of introduction, I just listed a couple points here that I want you to note. They're on your uh, verse sheet this morning. Uh, first of all, uh, it's essential for pleasing God. Faith is essential for pleasing God. In Hebrews 11:6, 6, uh, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. If we do not have faith in God, if we do not believe his promises, if we do not believe him, how can, how can we please our Heavenly Father? You cannot please God with faithless prayers. You have to have faithful prayers. You have to have prayers that believe in God. Uh, you, you know how, 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 uh, how faith as a whole, when you believe somebody, it glorifies them. When you believe in somebody, it glorifies them. When somebody says to you, I'm going to do such and such, and they give you their word, and you believe them, it glorifies them, doesn't it? But when you say, I just do not believe that that's possible. When you have faithlessness, when you are not believing the person, you do not please them. I say that asking God to give you something you don't think he can is an insult, and it's not a compliment. This, uh, this last Thursday, Max, he says to me, he says, he says uh, you can bring the baptistry out, which is important because his grandson's being baptized. And, uh, you know, I didn't even bat an eye, although I was looking at the text, but I didn't bat an eye. I, I just said, great, awesome. You know, I, I didn't wonder in my, in my spirit, like, I just, does he have the ability to do this? Is he, is he as strong as his pastor? You know, we know he's not as good looking. Is he as strong as his pastor? And, and I didn't say, well, does he have a, does he have a truck that is, that is capable of moving this thing? And can I just tell you, he takes this baptistry and he puts it up into his, into his barn, which is, I don't know, it's about 10 or 12 feet up in the air. And, uh, and, he, and uh, so we were over there the other day. We unloaded the baptistry. I helped him get it up there. And I thought to myself, I don't know how you do this by yourself. But so I'm out, so he gets it on a ladder and it's not full, of course, but he, he puts it on his shoulders and he must kind of contort his body and he gets it up there. He, he might just do it one arm. <laughs> he just, just kind of throws it up there. But, but I, didn't, I, didn't, uh, I didn't question whether or not that he could actually come through on his promise. Because faithfulness, when I believe Max, that kind of glorifies Max. I have no doubt that he is able to do what he said he's willing to do. Pleasing God happens when you are trusting him to deliver on his promises. When you can say in the quietness of your mind or audibly, I believe that God can do this. And when you don't, that does not glorify God. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. So it's essential for pleasing God, number one. Number two, it's essential for obeying God. Mark eleven twenty two 22 says, And Jesus answering said unto them, Have faith in God. Have faith in God. And if Jesus says that we are to have faith in God, that is a commandment. This isn't, this isn't an option. This is an obligation. Jesus said to have faith in God. And when you are not having faith in God, when he's commanded you to, you are breaking a commandment. And when you break a commandment, what is that called? Sin. Most people don't look at faithlessness as a sin, but it is a sin. When we do not have faith, it's a sin. Mark eleven twenty two, right? And Jesus answered unto them, have faith in God. When we do not act in faith, it is also sin. Romans fourteen twenty three. for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So it's not just believing in faith, it's acting out in faith. And you'll usually find these coupled together in Scripture. They believe something about God, they believe his promises, and then they act in faith in accordance with that. So it's essential for pleasing God and it's essential for obeying God. All right, now let's get on to the message. Let's talk primarily about the education of faith, the education of faith. Now to explain faith, you have to see what it looks like in the context of, of the scripture. Uh, first of all, one must remember that, the, uh, that even the disciples lacked faith at times. They also lacked faith in Mark 4.40, uh, and he said unto them, why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? Now, uh, this account was, uh, was at the time that Jesus had uh, stilled the storm on the Sea of Galilee, and uh, many of us in this very room were 
uh, in Israel, and uh, we uh, we were we were just about to get on the boat, and uh, it was kind of a it was kind of an exciting thing. We're all ready to get on, and and the guide who was going to take us out on the boat, I think his name was David. Is that right? Something like that. We're going to make up that name, David. And, uh, and he looks out, uh, you know, at the sea, or at the, at the sky, and he says, he says, well, we might want to wait out the storm. We thought, well, you know, it can't be all that bad. You know, it should probably be no problem at all. And, and, uh, but we didn't get on the boat. We waited out the storm. So we went over near the, uh, the commode, and uh, we stood outside, kind of gathered by this little bathroom with a shelter. And, and man, I tell you what, that, that storm came. Do I hear an amen? amen? Yeah, those people that were there knew and uh, there was this bolt of lightning, and uh, I, it was like the finger of God, just wham, right in front. He was like, whoa, yeah, that was close. And, and the wind was howling, and the rain was like sideways, you know, and then, uh, and then it just stopped. The sun came out and dried up all the rain. And, it's, and I looked out there, I was like, man, that is crazy. And so when you read these accounts, of these storms whipping up on the Sea of Galilee, we had firsthand experience that this is indeed true. And so in Mark 440, this is the account where Jesus stills the storm. And he said unto them, why are you so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? Remember the disciples were on this boat and, and uh, the storm brews up and he looks to the master and says, carest thou not that we perish? Well, of course Jesus cares. But it's interesting to me he asked this question, how is it that you have no faith? By this time in Jesus' ministry, by the time you get to Mark 4, Jesus had already proven himself time and time and time again. We see in chapter 1, verse 25, he heals the one with the unclean spirit. Chapter 1, verse 41, he cleanses the leper. In chapter 2, he heals the paralytic. Chapter 3, he heals the man with the withered hand. He has a record of faithfulness. And why is it that the disciples were so concerned and why is it the disciples did not have the faith that they could have had and should have had? Well, they're no different than us at times. There are times, though, we have seen God's faithfulness over and over and over again in our lives. We still question, can God perform on his promises? Can God perform on his promises? And there's a lot of people that I find uh, that, that they are kind of almost okay with having uh, a reduced level of faith. They are okay with, uh, with not exercising. And they might even say, they, they might say, well, I don't have the kind of faith that so-and-so has. Have you ever heard anybody say that? Well, they have, they have an extra measure of, of faith. But don't be settled. Don't, 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 don't settle for that. Don't settle for this notion that we cannot grow in our faith because we can grow in our faith, and we'll talk about that in just a few minutes. You have to remember Mark 11.22 was written to a bunch of faithless followers, and that was when he said, have faith in God. Now Mark 11.23-24 11, uh, says this, For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe, here's the faith, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. We must believe in them. We must believe. Believe that you receive them. How many of us can actually say that when we, when we pray, we actually believe that? I mean, I, I, there is some skepticism in my prayers oftentimes, and, and I know it just bleeds over into people. I might be praying with my wife. I might be praying at night with my kids, and I'm praying. I'm like, Lord, bring so-and-so out for church. And in my mind, the back of my mind, I'm like, Lord, they ain't coming out to church. You know that. They said they'd come out to church. That is, means that they ain't coming out to church. You know how that is, right? You, you, you knock on somebody's door and you say, hey, brother, we'd love to have you out to church. Oh, yeah, what time is service? Oh, 11 o'clock. Oh, perfect. I get up at 7. I'll be there. You know you're lying. <laughs> and so you're, I'm praying with, with my wife, and I'm like, Lord, please, I pray so-and-so's there. I pray so-and-so's there. I pray so -and, -so's there. I pray so -and, -so. and in my back of my mind, I'm like, there ain't no way they're coming out. It's a beautiful day. Last week it was 80-some degrees, and there's some skepticism, isn't there, in our prayers. How often is it that when we pray, we actually believe 
that God is going to answer and to hear our prayers. This is not uh, talking about hoping something is coming true, but knowing for certainty, knowing for certainty, absolute certainty, that what I'm praying for is in fact going to happen. People will say, some say, well, you can't pray a mountain into a sea. You can't, you can't have that much faith. You can pray that that whole mountain is carried away into the sea, as Jesus says here. And I say, well, you can pray for certainty if that's in fact where God wants it. If God wants that mountain in the sea, then you not praying is not trusting him to deliver on his promises. The, the, the parallel passage in, in uh, Matthew 17, 20 says, If you have faith as a grain of a mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. See, all things are possible to those that have properly placed faith. We just have to know where to properly place it. We have to know what to pray for. This isn't blind faith, and some people suggest it's blind faith. I had a, a guy I worked with, and I didn't work with him, I worked for him. He's worth a lot of money, and I remember I said I was going out to, this is uh, five years ago, I said, I'm going to go out to Davenport. And, and he says, oh, he says, wow, that's a lot of faith. And he says, with 12 families. And I said, no, with 12 people. And he looks at me, he says, people? He big eyes, and he says, and he said these words, he says, we take calculated risk because he was an investor, calculated risk. I think the impression is that we have blind faith when really we take calculated faith risk, don't we? We believe the Bible's true so we can calculate our faith. It's not just an accidental, this isn't just, I'm out there just uh, casting guesswork out there. It's, I believe because there's a calculation. And the calculation is in, is in God's word. Secondly, so first of all, one must remember that, that even his, dis, his disciples lacked faith. And secondly, one was, must remember that even his disciples didn't know how to pray. Now we might ask ourselves, well, that is just crazy. How can the disciples not know how to pray? In Luke 11, 1, and it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, referring to Jesus, when he ceased, so Jesus stopped praying, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. Lord, teach us to pray. See, his disciples didn't start out these, these awesome prayer warriors. They didn't start out with having this tremendous amount of faith, though we would think in our, in our minds that, that having seen the miracles that he'd done in Mark 1, 2, 3, and by the time you get to 4, he says, man, these guys should just be prayer warriors. They should have faith that is just what rocked this world. And yet, by the time you get to Luke 11, he's asking, the disciples are asking, saying, Lord, will you teach us how to pray? D.L. Moody said, we are not told that Jesus ever taught his disciples how to preach. But, but he taught them how to pray. He wanted them to have power with God. Then he knew they would have power with man. You see, preaching is our communication to man. Prayer is our commun communication to God. And that is more important. Our communication with God is much more important. I would much rather have that. And so even the disciples didn't know how to pray, and so they asked God, they said, teach us how to pray. Educate us, Lord. Help us. Teach us what we ought to do in order to have the communion that you might have with the Father. So first, it's the education of faith. Secondly, it's the exercise of faith. The exercise of faith. Now, if we are to exercise our faith, we must first have our faith, right? Faith first comes through knowing God's word. And Romans 10, 17 is a key verse when we talk about having faith in God. Uh, Romans 10, 17 says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So faith comes by hearing. So if you want to grow in your faith, you have to grow by hearing the word of God. Praying in faith is impossible. Can I say this uh, declaratively this morning? That having faith in God, that praying in faith to God is impossible without knowing his word. You must know his word. R.A. Torrey says if we are to have real faith, we must study the word of God and find out what is promised. Then simply believe the promises of God. Faith must have a warrant. I love that. 
Very important. Faith must have a warrant. Trying to believe something that you want to believe is not faith. If I am to have faith when I pray, I must find some promises in the Word of God on which to rest my faith. But, it is, but in no case does real faith come by simply determining that you are going to get something you want. Faith isn't just, uh, well, I'm just guessing so. It's finding something in the Word of God and saying, now that I can rest my faith on. I believe that. I believe that what God said in His Word is true. It's going to be true. It is true. And it will come to pass because that's what God said. Therefore, the authority of the Word of God is vital in our prayer life. The authority of the Word of God is vital in our prayer life. There are a lot of people, there are a lot of modernists today, there are people who are liberal in their theology, there are people that do not believe the miracles of God, there are people that do not believe the Bible. There are some people, Christian people, what you call them Christian people, who, who, say, who, who, who try to tear apart the Word of God and try to find all of its flaws and things like that. But let me just tell you, it'll, it'll withstand the test of time. But they say, well, that isn't true, and that isn't true, and that isn't true. And can I tell you what that does to prayer life? <laughs> Let me tell you why. Because if we cannot trust the Bible to be true, we cannot trust the promises of God. If we cannot trust the promises of God, what are we resting our faith on? People who have, say, well, I don't really have a prayer life. You've got to go first to him and ask him and say, well, how much do you believe of the Word of God? And they say, well, I don't, I don't a whole lot know about the Word of God, but I don't necessarily believe that every word is, is, is perfect. I don't believe that these, this is God's Word. I don't believe everything. And you say, well, you have nothing to base your faith on. You have to base your faith on something, or else you'll have these flawed promises. If the Bible is rejected, our faith will not increase, and our prayers will not be answered. How can you have prayers answered if you have no faith because the thing that you're believing isn't true? Faith first comes when we discover these truths. There's a great hymn, and uh, I think I've got it here. Wonderful hymn. Uh, it's called, My Faith Has Found a Resting Place. It says this, Not in device nor creed. I trust the ever-living one. His wounds for me shall plead. I need no other argument. I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. One of the best verses, I think, begins in verse 3 where it says, My heart is leaning on the Word, the written Word of God. If we don't lean on the Word of God, if we don't know for certain that that, that that is in fact true, then what are we placing our faith in? We need to know that the Bible is indeed true. Luke 17, 5, And the apostle said unto the Lord, Increase our faith. And we need to increase our faith. I need to increase my faith. And oftentimes when I pray, I pray so faithlessly and I ask myself, I'm like, Lord, please increase my faith. I want to, I want to have better faith than this. I want to have the kind of faith that I know for certain things will come true. And how does a person increase their faith? If the disciples prayed it, if we are to pray it, then how does a person increase their faith? Well, let me give you some application. Here are three simple ways to increase your faith. Three simple ways. I need, uh, but in order to do this, I need some volunteers. How many kids do we have in here? Do we have any kids? I sent them all up. All right, I need, uh, I need a couple, I need three adults. Or two adults. Three, three adults. We got two kids. Yes, Eliana. Can I use you as an example? Okay, awesome. I need two adults, two more adults. They're going to hate me for this. Okay, Deb, why don't you guys come on up here? Why don't you come on up here? I need, uh, you come up here. Come on up here. I need one more. I need one more. Eric, come on up. I baptize you. I baptize you. Okay, you just stand right down here. Stand right down here. Okay, here we go. This is what we're going to do. Uh, I want to show you an example of, uh, of what faith is. Okay, I want to I explain something to you. I am going to pretend I'm God for just a moment. Okay, now I'm not God. I'm not God. I'm not pretending I'm the king of kings and lord of lords. Also, I mean, I do have king-size Reese's peanut butter cups. The king of chocolate and lord of peanut butter. Here's what I'm going to do. As the king of kings and lord of lords, I have declared that I want to give each one of you 
a Reese peanut butter cup, a king size Reese peanut butter cup. So this is what I'm going to do. I have said that this is good for you. It's good for you. It's good for you. It's good for you. It's good. These are good for you. This is they're like vitamins. And, uh, and I want to make sure that every single one of you right now gets a, yeah, yeah. And you can't eat these until you get over, but, you know, until the service is over. But I want to make sure you all get one of these, okay? Because I'm God, and I'm decreeing that this is good for you, and I want to give all of you this one right now, okay? Here we go. But in order to do this, I just want you to ask me. For That's all I want you to do. I just want you to say, say uh, you know, can I, have a, can I have one of these? Can I have one? Yes, you may have one. Now, I gave it to you because you asked, number one, right? But because I have said to you, this is good for you, and I want you to have it, right? Okay. All you need to do is ask me for one. Can I have one? Yes, you may. There you go. Okay. I have given it to him because he has asked me. I have decreed that I want to give them chocolate, not because they're my kids. I mean, they're one of the only three kids, two of the only three kids in here, but, uh, but because I've said it's good for you, and you asked me for something that what? That I want you to have. That I have said I want you to have. Okay, all you have to do is ask me. Yes, you may. Now, we have a conundrum, don't we? When we get to you, what are you going to do? Ah, <laughs> no, no, you have to give that to her. You have to give that to her. You can't destroy my illustration, okay? <laughs> now, the way you said that was uh, very timid. It was almost in, uh, in skepticism. Would you agree that she's skeptical? Yes or no? Yes, she is. Yeah, she, I, I'd be skeptical too, to be honest with you. But, so she's skeptical that, that because I, I, had, I had, now I told you I was going to give you one. And you asked, that's all you had to do. But there was some skepticism because you don't see that I have one. Now, I will say this, that it just so happens that I do have one right here. So she asked me, and I want to give this to you. Yes. Nah. Now, it's interesting, her tone changed, because she saw that I do indeed have one. Now we get to Eric. Where's mine? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's, I'm so glad you came up as the fifth. Yeah. <laughs> so Rebecca said she can ask, actually, in faith, okay? Uh, so, Eric, what, what's going to happen when I get to you? May I have one? Yes, you may, as a matter of fact. Now, now, don't go anywhere yet. Don't go anywhere yet. If I was to say that I wanted everybody in this room to have one, what is running through your mind right now? Do you have enough? So the, so the question is, the question is, do I have enough? <laughs> now, here's what I'm asking. Here's what I'm asking. Am I good on my words so far? Yes, yes I am. Okay, you may be seated. Now, I want to develop this illustration. I want to develop this illustration just for a moment. The first way you grow in your faith is by getting to know God's Word better. Getting to know God's Word better. John R. Rice said this, Faith is really depending on God's faithfulness to do what He agrees to do. I am agreeing to do what I promised them. So they have to get to know me. They must, all the, the, the kids and, and Deb and Eric, they have to get to know me. To know that I am going to come, tr I'm, I'm going to come through on my word. I have promised them. I have said it's good for you. All you need to do is ask. When we got to Deb and she didn't see the, the unlimited resource, she was a little skeptical. Now had she seen the box... She would have said, no, no, I know he's got a box under that, under that pulpit of his. I know he's got chocolate there, and, and I'm going to ask him. And now, I will say this, Rebecca did see the box. So she knew, you didn't see the box. Okay, she just knew I was going to come through my word. Yeah, she believed me. Yeah, Sorry, Deb, this is horrible. This is making me look terrible. So, 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 so here's the thing. Here's the thing. We have to get to know God through his word. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. How can you trust in someone you do not know? Faithfulness is developed through uh, 
understanding, learning, reading the scriptures. So three quick things. Read the Bible. Get to know him. Read the Bible. All we need to do is trust God on his promises that he's already made. I don't have to, I don't have to manufacture this stuff. I just have to discover it in the scripture. So we need to read the Bible, we need to memorize the Bible, and we need to meditate on the Bible. Reading it, memorizing it, and meditating on it. You have to know God in order to know what he's promised. And then can I just share this with you? If you ask God for things he's promised to give you, you can guarantee you're going to get it. Just like Ben and Josh and Eliana, all they had to do was just ask me for something that they knew I was going to deliver on. They saw the chocolate in the hand. I promised it to them. Either that or they're going to make a liar out of me. And now when you talk about the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, he can't lie. So if he's promised, he's got to deliver. So when I pray, I can actually go to the throne of God and I can say, Lord, you said this, and I am taking this to the bank, and I am going to cash that check because you promised it. We have to know what that is though, don't we? We have to know what it is he's promised. So first of all, we have to get to know God. Secondly, we need to remember what it is he's done for you in the past. Remember what it is he has done for you in the past. When we forget what he's done, we'll deny what he said he'll do. We cannot forget those things. Next week, if I was to come out with three more pieces of chocolate and I was, to, I was to look at five people up here and I get to the fourth person and it just so happens to be Deb and I say, Deb, I have promised everybody chocolate. All you need to do is ask me. I guarantee her faith would increase because she would say, he's done it before in the past. He has come through on his promise. So never forget the things that God has done. And the way that you can do that is, is really a, a, a manifold way of doing it, but you can write things down and make prayer journals and make answers to the prayers that you've asked for. You, you can uh, give testimonies and, and, and all sorts of things, but never forget what it is God has done because what he has done is, only, only to, to, uh, is an example of what he said he'll do in the future. If he said he's going to provide and he's promised providing, then all you need to ask is say, Lord, will you provide for me? And you can just smile with, with, with joy and say, Lord, you've done it before in the past and, and you've promised it. And I have everything to look forward to. So secondly, remember what he's done for you in the past. And thirdly, get out of his way and let him do what he's good at. Get out of God's way and let him do what he's good at doing. George Mueller says that before one can pray, one's heart must have, and he quotes this, no will of its own in regard to a given matter, end quote. When you, when you pray to God and you say, Lord, I just, I just want you to provide for me because that's what you promised, you need to just scrub your will from there. Say, I don't know what provision looks like, God. All I know is that you said you would provide for me, and whatever that might look like to you, I'll be fine with. You see, because I think in our own hearts and minds, we have, a, we have kind of this preconceived notion of, of what, what uh, provision really looks like. And then when we don't get it, we say, well, Lord, I thought you were going to provide you know, uh, you know, gift cards to Applebee's for the rest of my life. And he says, no, no, you asked for provision, and that's what I promised, so that's what I'll give you. And you know what? It might be ramen noodles. And we, we eat some ramen noodles in our house. Our boys love the ramen noodles. And especially, there's a lot of ways you can make ramen noodles. You ever pour spaghetti sauce on your ramen noodles and bathe it in Parmesan cheese and croutons? I mean, you can do a lot of things with, a, with, a, with a ramen noodles, but maybe that's God's intent for providing for you. But if we go into a matter and we pray and we say, Lord, this is how I want you to provide, that's not what he promised, is it? If I was to have, if I was to have a Snickers bar and a Twizzlers and, um, and a Reese's peanut butter cup up here, and I was to say to him, to say to the group, I want you to ask me for a Reese's peanut butter cup. And that is what my will is for your life. If they were to ask me for the Snickers, I would deny them. Because that is not my will for their life. My will is to give them something I already have. Now, if they were to say, if I was to say, I will give you provision and have three things out here, I might say to them, I might say to them, we'll take your pick. But sometimes God doesn't work that way. 
But he does work this way. He will always fulfill his promises. We must never approach an issue uh, with a bent of our own. We must in faith look to him on any given matter. So firstly, we've got to get to know God's word better. Secondly, we need to remember what he's done in the past. And thirdly, we, we have to get out of his way and let him do what he's great at doing, providing and, 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 and delivering on his promises. He will never, never not deliver. He will never not deliver. I don't know how many of you guys get stuff dropped off by UPS. And praise God for UPS. We have seen the UPS driver drive by. And then something pops up on my phone and it said, attempted delivery. What are you talking about? Now, I've been on the phone with the customer service and I'm like, no, no, he didn't even pull in the parking lot. Well, no, our guy said he pulled in the parking lot. I'm like, well, your dude is a liar. <laughs> I am sitting on the grass in front of our church. He did not pull in. And I just want to, if he's saying on deliver, I want him to deliver, at least attempt to deliver. Well, okay, well, we got back to you. He said there were no cars in the parking lot. You've been around here around 5 o'clock in the afternoon. There's 12 cars out here. It's crazy. I say, no, if God says he's going to deliver on a promise, he is going to deliver on a promise. And we need to trust him at that. And in conclusion, let me just say this. Faith, is a, faith is a, has, has kind of a wide uh, spectrum to it. When a person trusts Christ as their Savior, they, they believe Jesus Christ died on the cross for them, was buried and rose again. They have faith in God. Where are they placing their faith? In God, but basically on what the Bible says is true. This is the, this is the origin of faith. And uh, when a person makes it to be a very, very, very old person, say they're 60, <laughs> nine, and uh, say, they're, say they're very old, and, and, um, and the person dies. Uh, their faith was somewhere along this timeline throughout life. They may have had moments of, of greater faith than others. They might have believed and then prayed to God, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief at times. And we always pray that, don't we? It seems like I'm a, keep going back to God and say, Lord, I do believe. I do believe. This is the promise that you made in the word of God, but I'm really doubting right now. And somewhere along this, this from the time that you have trusted Christ as your Savior to the time you die, your faith is somewhere on that line. And we need to pray that our faith increases so that when we get to be this ripe old age of 69, we can have tremendous rock-solid faith in God. And we can be the testimony to the next generation and say, this is what God said. And I believe that with my whole heart. He didn't say he was going to provide every, all of our wants. He said needs. And you know what? I'm 38 years old and I have never been without there have been times that my checking account had very little money in it, down to the dollars, single digits. And you know, I looked to God and I said, Lord, I don't know how you're going to do this, but you've got to figure this thing out. But you know what? Even if we didn't have money in there, you know something? That didn't mean God didn't provide. Because provision looks differently to all of us, but what does it look like to God? In Matthew 6.33, he talks about this. And all these other things shall be added unto you. What were these things that should be added unto you? Food and raiment. If you can tell, I'm not starving to death. We need to trust God in his promises. And friends, if you're here today and you don't know Christ as your Savior, if you don't know where you're going when you die, can I just share this quick illustration? Don't put your Bibles away yet. I just want you to look at this. Pay real close attention to my wallet. And I want you to think about this. Here we are with all of our sin. The Bible says God loves us but hates our sin. God says that the wages of this sin is death. That's separation. It's not church membership. It's not water baptism. It's not walking an aisle. It's not joining a church. It doesn't say that the wages, the wages of sin is church membership. The wages of sin is death. Someone has to die. 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ came to this earth to die on the cross for our sins. He was buried and he rose again the third day, proving that his payment, his death payment, was sufficient for us. Now, we get this from the Bible. We get this from God's Word. This is what he said. So we go to the Word of God and we are trusting. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. We are trusting that what God said is true. 
And what God says to you is true. It has to be true or he's a liar. And if he's a liar, he's not God. Then what are we doing here? We have to trust him on his promises. And I'm so thankful that when you open the scripture, the scripture is replete with, with all manner of promises to us. It just has so many things in there that we can just testify of and say, yes, Lord, I believe that, and I believe that. It must, as Ari Tori said, have warrant. That's where our faith, our faith has found a resting place. And it's in Jesus Christ. And so if you're here today and you don't know Christ as your Savior, I just beg you that you place your faith in Him alone as your Savior. It's not about living a good life by turning over a new leaf, turning from all your sin. It's about trusting Jesus as your Savior. If you were, if you were on a boat drowning, or in a river drowning, and a boat came by, and a guy there with a, with, with, with a, you know, with a rope, and he throws it to you, you don't have to trust that that uh, you don't have to say, you know, you're the Savior and, 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 I, and I, I, I am now committing my life to you. I, I am going to just live a life that pleases you for, forever. That's not salvation. Salvation is when you receive his free gift of salvation. You say, Lord, you say, Savior, I, I believe you died for me and I believe you're here to save me. It's not about you committing your life to them. That's, that's discipleship, friends. That's not salvation. And I thank God for the distinction there that we don't work our way to heaven. We just believe Jesus died for us. If you're here today and you don't know that, I just pray that you place your faith in Him alone as your Savior. That He died for you. Mm -hmm.